Yes, life can be so full of surprises. Because when I was growing up as a little girl, I was so much favored by my father among all my siblings. I was this intelligent, bubbly little girl. And we could always move together with my dad wherever he wanted to go. And one day he asked me, okay, Susan, what do you want to be in life, in the future? What are your aspirations? And because I had grown up in a poor family, a family that was struggling, my dad was a teacher, a primary school teacher, and my mom was a primary school teacher as well. Um, they were not paid highly, of course. And I was seeing how both my parents were struggling with the six of us to make sure that we have food, we have clothing, and other basic needs. Um, it actually touched me as a young girl. And then when daddy asked me what I wanted to be, I just answered him excitedly, oh daddy, I want to be a banker. <laughs> because I thought of one who works in a bank, has access to the stack of money that is in the bank. So I wanted to give that much money, give to my dad so that he would be able to support us as a family. And he was like, hmm, okay. But he did not ask me why I wanted to be a banker. But that was my reason. And life continued. And then after some years went by, my dad was laid off work. And then it was only my mom who was the breadwinner of the family. I was 16 years old when I was called in the living room and both my parents told me, Susan, look here, we know you're a very brilliant girl and you love your studies, but we are not able to continue with you in school because we want to also help your siblings, the young ones, um, to reach your level. But then I had only um, finished my ordinary level, left with my high school to go to university. It was really difficult for me to take in, but I understood the situation. And then that's how I dropped out of school. Not because I didn't want to study, not because of anything, but because we didn't have um, money to pay for our school fees. I went to the city to look for a job, and after some months, I got a job, and then I started working, earning some little money which I could use to send back to, to home to support my family. Then when I was 18, I got pregnant, and then I had a baby girl. I was staying with the father of the baby, we were not married, but in Uganda, when you cohabit, they usually refer to it as, oh, marriage. So um, the media called him my husband, and that's what picked up everywhere. And we were happy. We didn't have much. We were not rich, to be honest, but he loved me. And because I had grown up with this love of my dad, I really appreciated the love that was given to me. And so I didn't complain as a young girl. I didn't know much of what he used to do. Yeah, I didn't ask because he was way much older than me. Um, but I was comfortable with the fact that you could at times bring food on the table. And then one day, one day changed my life forever. We had dinner together and went to sleep as usual. And what woke me up in the night was a sharp, a sharp object on my neck. 
when I woke up, a sticky warm fluid was flowing down my neck. I was trying to check, then I ran out. To my surprise, the door was wide open. I ran out, I realized that blood was gushing out of my body, and then I fell down and I lost consciousness. They had cut me deeply on the neck, as you can see. My husband did not survive. He didn't make it to the hospital. In the morning, I was told that he died and I survived narrowly. I was very weak. I could not walk on my own, except if I'm supported from both sides. After three days of his burial, one day my family were taking me to the hospital and I got arrested. The police officer said, the family of the late alleging you are the one who killed your husband. If not, why didn't you die too? I couldn't believe my ears. I was going through a lot of pain. I had lost the man I loved. I was in pain. I had so many questions. Who has done it? Why has he done it? Because we were not rich and they did not take anything, nothing. They just came to take life. In that scuffle, my, my family were trying to refrain them from taking me and the police officer was pulling me away and my daughter was in between crying. It's such a horrible act that I remember. She was young. She didn't know what was going on. But she was crying and looking at the woman who was taking her away, her mother. And that's how I was separated from my daughter for 16 years. I stayed in the police cells for two months because the police were confused. How should we charge such a person? They deliberated. But of course, where there is a will for someone to take you to prison, with the corruption in our legal systems. I did not survive. I was taken to the court and because it was a capital offense, was not allowed to, to plead either guilty or innocent. And then I was taken to the prison. When I was growing up, I had believed that no one in prison, there is no one who is innocent. I knew that everyone who goes to prison must have committed a crime. I did not have any sympathy for prisoners. I didn't know much about the law, but that's, that was my belief. I strongly believed that any innocent person can never go to prison because I believed in the judges. To me, I thought when I was growing up that these judges are like God. They can see through the lies and they don't make mistakes. And throughout those two years before I was produced for my trial, I still held on to that belief. I still held on to that trust that when I'm going to be produced before the judge for my trial, he will see through the lies and he will find me innocent. I did not worry much about whether I would be convicted because I knew I was innocent. After two years, I was taken to the judge. It was a high court judge. 
and my trial began. I didn't have a lawyer of my own because I didn't have the money to afford one. But the state provides all capital offenders with state briefs or state lawyers. And these lawyers, you meet them on the very day you're supposed to stand before the judge for your trial. They just allocate them files and they can be having in one session about five to 10 files to expedite. And these are lawyers that are paid peanuts. They don't have time to do groundwork for a case. They don't have time to look for witnesses in support of your case. Because they want to get finished so that they are paid. And imagine the state, which is the prosecuting agency, gives you this lawyer. And this lawyer is going to be paid by the state. So one can think. But because for me, I didn't have money to afford my own lawyer, I had to oblige. And then when the trial started, witnesses came from nowhere. They were testifying against me. I was shocked. And finally, this little boy, all the evidence was circumstantial, but then it was actually weakening the case, but they realized that we are going to lose this case if we don't find something. So they brought this little boy. They had coached him. They sat him near the judge, and the little boy said, I saw, I saw how my father was being cut. And Susan cut my father. Just that. And this little boy was woken up that night of the murder. He was woken up in the morning by the neighbors who bathed him he didn't know what happened. And a little boy, to be awake at 3 a.m. was also a question. I have nothing against this little boy. He was just a child. And I understand that he had no power to say no. Actually, he even did not know what he said. Because after he had grown, Someone sent me a message that he regrets what he said. I've not met him for. And then on the judgment day, I was still very hopeful. Oh, Susan. I still had the faith that even if all that has been said, still I'm going to be set free. Because I still trusted in the legal justice system of my country. I, I trusted in the judge. And then the judgment was read and the final verdict was Susan Chigula, this court finds you guilty of murder and therefore I sentence you to suffer death by hanging. That is the form of execution Uganda has, death by hanging. <sighs> um, it was like the world was crumbling on me I went numb, I could not believe, I could not believe, I mean, I could not believe myself. Why? How? I 
felt betrayed by my own legal justice system. I thought about my daughter. She was so young. I thought about my parents. My dreams. My aspirations. Everything had come to an end. I believed in God. I prayed to God for the truth to come out. But I felt like God was not there. And I was taken away to the death row section. And this time, I was to wait for my fate. When I arrived at the death row section, I met other women who had been sentenced to death, and most of them had not even gone to school. English is our official language. It is the language that is used in courts, and most of them had not even understood their court's proceedings. Majority of them were innocent, seriously. And the minority who are guilty had committed crimes of passion or maybe defending themselves from abusive husbands who are repeatedly maybe raping them or battering them every day. And because they are women, they are not supposed to, to say anything so in the end, in the course of defending themselves, they killed their husbands. But my analysis was nobody deserved to be on death row. I lived in anger, I lived in bitterness, I lived in resentment until one day I got tired of that life. I mean, what was the point of getting angry with people who are not even here to see that I'm angry? And if I wallow into this self-pity for long, I may fall sick. And I didn't want that. I wanted to live for my daughter. I wanted my daughter to be proud of me one day. I knew I was not a criminal, so I said I'm not going to live like a criminal. And then I encouraged myself again in the Lord. I drew strength from my, my inner person. I hoped again. And then I decided to do something for myself and for other women. And that's when I started a school in prison, in which school I enrolled as a teacher, teaching my fellow peers, and then also studying as well. That is the prison I was incarcerated in. If Aaron can run the slides. And we had those different trees, so we made them our classes. Because we didn't have teachers, we didn't have classes. And then there was a lot of improvement. Women started learning English, learning how to read and write, and we took on formal education in the prison. I too studied for my advanced level because now I wanted so much to go to university level. Now I wanted it. I got an opportunity and I wanted to utilize the opportunity. After two years of my studying, 
I sat for the examinations. Same students sit for even outside prison in those prestigious schools. And I was among the best in the country. I couldn't believe myself. I was very happy, I was very excited. Yes, I have done something at least, yes. And now the media came to prison and this time they were writing good about me. Susan the intelligent girl, Susan the promising girl, there is a genius in prison. And then, yeah, for the first time, they wrote good about me. And then we had McLean Alexander, as a, I have him as my friend and he's a British lawyer and magistrate who used to come in prison when he was still a student. He could come, encourage us, and set up a library, support the women who had babies from prison. And this time when he heard about it, because it really went viral, and he, he told me, Susan, I've come to see you, but there is some good news for you. Because this time I could not start a university. That was way too much for me. And he told me that I've managed to secure you a scholarship from the University of London. It's going to be a distant learning program. I was very, very excited and I told him, okay, tell me, what discipline have they given me to study? And he told me, low. Huh. <laughs> not me, not me. I told him, McLean, not me. I don't want to have to do anything with law. I hate law. I hate the lawyers. I hate the judges. I hate courts. I hate everything that is related to law. Please, it's a no. Because what the law had called justice, to me it was an injustice. He went back to England. After a while, he came back. And when he came back, DHL had shipped in books. I met him in the prison officer's office. So many boxes of books. He sat there, and my identity card from the University of London I had been enrolled. Oh, I was very happy this time now. Things have worked out. So he told me, Susan, here I am. You're now a student enrolled. Okay, see your identity card. Check it, and we're very excited. And then uh -huh, told me, what subject am I going to study? He told me, low. I told him, McLean, maybe you did not understand me. He said, Susan, I understand your pain. And I know what you're going through. And I do believe there are other women who are going through what you're going through. Not only here in Uganda, but all over the world. But I have seen what you've been able to achieve, not only for yourself, but for others in prison. If you study law, you're going to be able to help yourself and others like you. Not only in Uganda, but all over the world. Hmm. I was in prison on death row. How am I going to help people all over the world? But there is one sentence that struck me. He told me that you're going to bring a difference in your life and in the lives of others. I calmed down. I accepted and started on my challenging journey of studying law from prison. The university itself was skeptical about whether a prisoner in prison on death row can study law. So they started me on a diploma level. And after two years of my studying under a tree, that is the court. Um, under a tree with no lecturers, I didn't have internet. I didn't know even how to use a computer. I didn't have one. I did my studies by reading, except the university sent me some lectures 
they were brief on introduction of per topic that I had to go through. I read extensively. I had to understand all the legal concepts alone. I had no cosmic. I had nobody to exchange ideas with. But wherever McLean could come to visit, he would ask me how it was going. At, and at one time, I wanted out. I told him, no, 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 no. McLean, I told you this is too complex. This is so very difficult. And he told me, Susan, if you have reached that level, then you're going to do it. Because he told me there is no lawyer, no magistrate or judge who has never gone through what you're going through. Like everyone who studies law reaches a point when they feel like, I can't take it anymore. But then they push on. And then I sat for my exams. And when they came back, they were shipped back to the University of London and I was among the best 30 students, including the on-campus students. The University of London is really big and has so many students. But Professor Jenny told me that you are among the first 30 best students. I couldn't believe myself. It was, I was dedicated. It was because I committed myself. It was because I, I had self-discipline. I had self-sacrifice. It was so difficult. I was always discouraged. Some prison officers would ask me why I'm studying law, yet I'm going to be hanged. My fellow prisoners would just make noise, just to distract me, just to disorganize me. They would mock me. You're studying law for what? But I was determined. I closed my ears. And I said, I will run this race alone and I will finish it. With the legal knowledge that I had acquired during my diploma level, I opened up a legal aid clinic, albeit informal in prison, and started helping my fellow inmates with their legal issues. They were too poor, they could not afford lawyers, but they needed some basic legal information to carry on. So I was able to write for them memorandums of appeal, their submissions, prepare their defenses, and then also uh, take them through self-representation so that uh, at least they could stand before a judge or a magistrate and explain themselves. I also helped to build their self-esteem. And there's so many getting their freedom. Others were sentenced to lesser sentences. They were living in mean prison. I was not jealousy. I was very happy because I started to see the impact that my studies and my resilience was having on other people. The university extended the scholarship for me this time to study for a law degree because they were highly impressed by my performance. I continued to study and in the due course we were 417 other inmates on death row. We had no hope. All appeals were not helping. I started a choir in prison. We could sing songs concerning the death penalty, HIV AIDS, a church choir. But of course my main aim was to send a message to reach out to the authorities. And we started receiving a political figures coming in prison to see us, and wherever I could get an opportunity, I would talk and tell them about our plight and situation. Of course, I didn't see much changing, but then the message went out and other groups started mobilizing themselves to come to our support, and then we had these uh, lawyers coming in to support us, 
it's a legal firm or a law firm. We had Foundation for Human Rights Initiative coming in and other pressure groups and other international groups. And then I led the petition. I led the case. I led 417 other prisoners in that petition against the death penalty, against mandatory death sentences, against the manner in which it is carried out by hanging because one of our colleagues um, signed um, an affidavit and narrated to the court how when he was still the officer in church, he witnessed hangings and executions. And he said sometimes people were very heavy that the rope could chop off their heads and the heads follow the other part and the blood gushes out and then it went through the cells of these other prisoners who are on death row and it was such a horrible sight. And then we were also saying mandatory death sentences were unconstitutional. All of us were sentenced under mandatory death sentences whereby even if a woman had been defending herself from a rapist, the judge could not consider the circumstances of the commission of the crime. She would outrightly be sentenced to death. We went through a series of trials. The government put up a fight, sent its strongest lawyers against the prisoners. We won the case, the government appealed, and then we went again to the Supreme Constitutional Court. And then finally in 2009, a judgment, final judgment came out. And mandatory death sentences were abolished in Uganda. They were declared unconstitutional. And all the 417 others that were on death row, the court held they had been unconstitutionally sentenced. However, the death penalty remained constitutional and the judges guided the legislators on matters concerning the enaction of laws that could enable that death penalty to be scraped off from our law books. We still have the death penalty, but we no longer have mandatory death sentences. And the period, the long period, the long stay on death row before one is executed was a torture, was so cruel, it was so inhuman. Someone could stay in, on death row for more than 20 years, go through that death row syndrome, uncertainty of not knowing when they are coming to take me to the gallows. And after all that time, still you executed the person. And then courts held that in three years' time, if the government does not execute or pardon the offender, then that person would automatically be um, serving life imprisonment. It was a great achievement. The petition became very famous. It is now a precedent a precedent in other um, legal uh, cases. Kenya uh, used it as a precedent in its case against mandatory death sentences under death penalty, and it was successful. The case has become a case study for all law students in Uganda, and it's cited in many other different countries. The laws of Uganda were changed in such a way. And all, all of us, most of us, were released automatically. And others went back for resentencing and then got our freedom. For now, out of the 417, there is no one on death row, except a few, because the Judgment held that a death sentence could be uh, given in the rarest of cases. 
So there are still some stubborn judges who feel like they get emotional and they sentence some people to death. But of course, most judges now know that they have the discretion to sentence to any other cri any other sentence, any other custody sentence aside from the death penalty. And so I, I am happy to tell you that I also um, graduated later on with my law degree, and I'm now a lawyer. Thank you. I came out of prison in 2016, but unfortunately, I phoned when my mom and my dad both had died. They died, I didn't find them. But my daughter was still around, she was now 17 years. By the time I came out of prison, a teenager, and we were very happy to be together again. Uh, right now, I am involved myself in the struggle, in the fight, in the movement against the death penalty worldwide. Uh, when I was just four months after coming out of prison, I was invited in Norway, Oslo, and then I gave a presentation there. And since then, I've never looked back. I have traveled so many different countries speaking about or against the death penalty. And I want to implore all of us here, even if Holland doesn't have the death penalty, if you carry out an opinion poll today, you'll be surprised that majority want it back. But I want to tell you that we don't need the death penalty. Not now, not in the future. Because two wrongs don't make a right. And it has never proven that it is a deterrent to crime. No. And how about the innocent ones like me? You'd rather keep that person in prison and later on, when that person gets exonerated, can go back in the society. Because you can get someone out of the prison but not out of the grave. I am now supporting children of prisoners. I have an organization, Sunny African Children's Center. These children are left to nobody. My government doesn't have any policy that looks after those children. They are left homeless. They go on the streets. Some die in the process. They have nothing to eat. They have nobody to protect them. Some have been exposed to human trafficking. Some to child labor. Others have been sexually abused. Others are experiencing early pregnancies. Some die during labor because of the young or tender age. And others commit crimes and they go back. They go to prison and they find their parents in prison. I do believe that these children, they have a right to live like normal children. They don't have to pay for what their parents did. They should not pay for their parents' mistakes. And so this is where my passion came from, to take care of them. I work with a cohort of lawyers. We work in Kenya and Uganda prisons. We help educate and equip prisoners and prison staff with basically good information that they can pass on to other poor prisoners who cannot afford lawyers so that they may be able to defend themselves in courts. I also support women who are in prison for more than 10, 20 years in their rehabilitation and in their reintegration back to society because it is always difficult for a woman to stabilize in society after being away for so long. Some are taken advantage of, and because we want to break the cycle of recidivism, I am there to give them a shoulder. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your time.